Hey, Josh. How are you, Glenn? Very good, thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm pretty good. You know, uh, as, as much as I like to teach, we are off all week uh, this week for Thanksgiving. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do like to teach, but I don't mind being off for a couple of days from it. It's, uh, yeah, it's a good thing. I don't know. It's uh, semester's getting me down. I, I feel like I'm really working for a living now. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a tough job. Yeah, well, that's why we get the big bucks. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's been... It's been a long, uh, it's been a pretty long uh, semester here as well. I think I mentioned to you, uh, or maybe I didn't, I don't know. I I took on an additional kind of teaching burden this term. This is not not the time or the place to get into all the details about it. But uh, I was moderating a course on poverty alleviation uh, at Google. Um, Oh. Yeah. It was really... uh, an amazingly, it's been it, the course ended last week. Although there, the it's there are some additional, uh, some extra sessions to focus on some projects. But is this a course among the employees, or that's something that's out on the web that people can uh, be involved in? No, the, the 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 sessions are behind the firewall. But uh, th- it was a course. So what happened was when Google went public in two thousand and four, they announced that they were forming a nonprofit wing. Uh, called Google.org and uh, hired Larry Brilliant uh, to be the CEO of Google.org uh, and announced that they were going to work in three areas, um, you know, on the principle that they don't go for low-hanging fruit. So it was climate change, global health, and global poverty. I see. And and they gave the... the, the uh, Google gave the .org... 1% of the stock value at the time of the IPO, 1% of annual profits. And 1%? Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yes, it's a it's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really a lot of money. Um, and and also, and this is I think the most, you know, interesting and unusual thing is, you know, Google gives its employ tells its employees they can work for like 20 I, I'm not sure I know all the details, but for 20% of their time on projects that are not essential parts of their day job. I see. So they also gave google.org a kind of uh, uh, access to employee time. So uh, as if to say, our employee. What's true? Our employees are our greatest asset, and they have a lot to contribute in these areas. But then they had the even more, uh, you know, uh, unusual, startling, and I think quite totally correct insight, which was that as passionate, as energetic, as bright, and as interesting as Google employees are, that they don't really know very much about these areas. Uh, and they should learn something about it. So they decided that they were going to run courses on um, the the topics that they were working on. And the first of these courses was a, was on uh, global poverty, global economic development, poverty alleviation. And it was a ten week course, met two hours a week. There were two talks a week. Each talk sort of you know twenty five or thirty minutes, and then an engaged discussion. And I was le- uh, you know opening things up by introducing the topics and then moderating the discussion between the. These were mostly. Uh, Google employees, um, not Google, not dot org employees, but dot com employees. There were uh, Google employees yeah. who were interested in doing stuff um, in these areas, and I have to say the uh, presentations were fantastic. I mean, really, you know, by very very good uh, people. A bunch of economists, some um, many of whom you would know, Lant Pritchett and. Ted Miguel, who teaches at uh, Berkeley, and Seema Jayachandran, who's here at uh, uh, Stanford, and Steve Radlett, who's at the Center for Global Development, Nancy Birdsall, who runs the Center for Global Development, yeah. um, Nancy Barry, who ran Women's World Banking for 15 years, and anyway, a whole bunch of people uh, came, and the presentations were interesting, and um and they've now the the and people in the in the dot org learned a lot from the presentations and 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 that helped to shape the projects that they're going to be devoting their time to and and now they're really trying in a more focused way to enlist the energies of uh, well, Google employees. So that sounds great. One of the advantages of being in uh, Silicon Valley. Then. Uh, it, yeah, it turned out to be a, a, a huge advantage. And, I, you know, I have to say, and we'll move off this topic in a second, and, and Google doesn't need me to be giving them accolades. Their you know, stock price is already high enough. 
uh, and I'm, I'm not going to move it at all. But I have to say, I don't think – I've asked a bunch of people about this. I don't study – you know, what companies do by way of, you know, educating their employees. But to the best of my knowledge, no company has ever done anything like this before. You know, companies have executive education programs, but this wasn't for executives. They have, uh, you know, they'll teach, you know, have programs so employees can learn, uh, yeah. you know, yoga breathing or something, but this wasn't about yoga breathing. Um it wasn't about the latest in logis- logistics, so it wasn't sort of specifically business related. It was open to all the employees, uh, and it was really, you know, very high quality stuff. So I, I think it's, uh, I think it was a fantastic thing, and um, yeah. I, uh, it, it did add to my teaching responsibilities for the fall. But boy, was it fun um, and interesting, and I learned a lot from it. Anyway, uh, on to. Bigger and better things or smaller and lesser things, smaller and lesser. Uh, uh, we both read, I think, um, the op-ed that uh, Skip Gates wrote in the New York Times this week, 40, acre, 40 Acres and a Gap in Wealth. Um, and, boy, did I think it was terrible. Well, um, you know, there was this big story about um, the Pew Research Center report uh, surveying right. Juan Williams uh, did a, um, a big piece on uh, National Public Radio about it. Uh, yeah. It's gotten covered all over. Uh, main empirical finding is that a big uh, plurality of respondents amongst African Americans uh, indicating that there is a schism between the uh, black middle class and the black uh, lower classes and that... Right. Uh, what was it, 37% of African Americans felt that blacks today can no longer be thought of as a single race because of this class divide. Right. I think the Times probably felt it necessary to have a major piece on the op-ed page. This was Sunday at the top of the page right. uh, on this issue, which of course is important. Yeah. And uh, I guess the thinking at the editorial page at the New York Times is who else would you go to to comment on this than, uh, than Skip Gates? Uh, now, and you know, working in the field myself, uh, it will sound a little bit like sour grapes if I criticize him, but I thought it was just an awful piece, really. I did. All right, a little sour grapes, not a bad thing. You know, turn it into good wine if we're lucky. But uh, <laughs> well, well, I don't care. Who I mean, you call I, let me ask you a question. Yeah, I, did you have you read the Pew report? I've not read the I Pew read, report. I've not okay, had time so, to read it yet. Okay, so I, I read some stories about the Pew report. I didn't hear the Juan Williams report. I, and, and now, maybe I'm confused about which report this was. I thought the big finding in this um, Pew report was about downward mobility uh, in, in the among African Americans that uh, born into the that uh, something like 45 percent of African Americans born into the middle class and the mid-1960s were now in the bottom quintile. Yeah, that's right. The uh, the uh, downward mobility across generations amongst blacks yeah. much greater than amongst much greater. whites. Yeah. The upward mobility for blacks much less than for whites. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, that's right. And there have been, you know, uh, pieces written about that, too. I, I don't know if this is the same Pew report or two different Pew reports, but this is what you just stated, another finding coming out of Pew just recently that's also right. gotten a lot of attention. Right. Which that seemed addressed. like a bigger finding than the finding that 37% of African Americans think that black, that this is the quote that, that comes from the Gates article, yeah. blacks, uh, that he's quoting the Pew report. 37% of African Americans polled felt that blacks today can no longer be thought of as a single race. Um, well, you know, it depends that, on whether your uh, point of view is about identity, yeah. in which case you're worried or concerned or, you know, alarmed or whatever about this kind of fragmentation of African American identity and what it might mean, or whether or not it's, you know, social structural. Yeah. Uh, and you're, in which case you're interested in what the underlying processes might be that inhibit social mobility. You know how important you may think right. uh, social mobility is for uh, a sense of equity in society and, you know, what the ramifications are, what the um, implications are of um, this kind of lo- less, uh, greater downward mobility, I should say, amongst blacks. What's going on in the African-American middle class? One might begin to ask these kind of questions. But I guess right. it did, you know, which of those findings uh, most strikes you as interesting, I think, depends on, um, depends on your point of view. I guess I, the thing that, you know, there, there was this huge disparity, as you say, between downward mobility for uh, African Americans and downward mobility for 
whites and really, a, I mean, the, the, and not just the disparity, but the sheer absolute numbers on the downward mobility for African Americans was pretty uh, startling and um, depressing, as are uh, the issues about you know, persistent uh, uh, persi- issues about persistent poverty. The thi- one of the things that I found uh, striking about the Gates piece, though, let me say first, it took a little bit of time to get past the completely shameless name dropping. I mean, I don't know how many words the piece is, but let's say it's about a thousand words. But in a thousand words, you mention the conversation that you had with. James Q. Wilson and with uh, William Julius Wilson, you mentioned uh, the conversation that you had with Whoopi Goldberg when you showed Whoopi Goldberg uh, about how her ancestors were uh, beneficiaries of a land grant. Yeah, and then uh, you, yeah, and then you conclude with the conversation about with what John Kenneth Galbraith once told you. Um, I don't know. Uh, Along the way, you extol Margaret Thatcher's social policy. Yeah, you you suggest Margaret. that uh, yeah. Daniel Patrick Moynihan was right about, um, and more than right about, the collapse of the black family. Too bad nobody listened. You yeah. forget that Jesse Jackson spent a big part of his career in the 1970s and early 1980s uh, advocating for self-help among blacks and uh, right. telling black kids to down with dope and up with hope. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, the piece is scatological. Josh, in my opinion, I mean, he goes from um, uh, black culture needs to be reformed to uh, uh, there needs to be there should have been forty acres and a mule because guess yeah. what he studied twenty I know twenty African American families and he has a social science conclusion based on that yeah. about the importance of wealth. Listen, Glenn, if you or I wrote something for the <laughs> op-ed for the New York Times and we said something as boneheadedly ridiculous about some work of literature <laughs> as Skip Gates says in his social science with his social science hat on I mean first of all we wouldn't have been published there and uh, secondly we would be uh, appropriate objects of the kind of uh, ridicule from peers that we're uh, uh, heaping on um, Skip now I mean ridiculous that you do a study with 20 people and you and, and here's the finding the finding is, this is you know, as we social scientists call it, sampling on the dependent variable. You look at twenty very success, really, really, incredibly successful African Americans. I mean, this is you know, it's Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey it's Whoopi Goldberg, it's you know, Jackie yeah, Joyner. J- Josh, I hear you. I, I hear you, and I know where you're going. Here's what I want to say: It's not yeah. about the truth. Yeah. The, I mean, the whole point here, and uh, actually. Uh, Political scientist Adolf Reed, I think, named this uh, and, and uh, really, really uh, uh, nailed it uh, in a piece, oh, maybe it's 10 years ago, maybe more in the Village Voice, yeah. called something like, Buana, what are the drums saying? Uh-huh. Okay? Uh-huh. And so that's a metaphor for the fact that a certain kind of African-American intellectual establishes himself within the American cultural elite right. as right. an interpreter of the drums. The, right. If you want to know right. what's up with the Negro folk, there's certain yeah. people that you go to, and their right. art is the characterization or the expression of it in a manner that's just not too rough to the sensibility yeah. of the yeah. of the typical reader yeah. of the New York Times or the yeah. New Yorker's uh, ear. And uh, and what Adolf Reed says is that Gates and others uh, and a few others, Cornell West among them, have uh, sort of cornered this market, yeah. and it's to the detriment of serious, well, in uh, Reed's case, political critique. Yeah. Uh, in our case of uh, social analysis, it's not about the truth. It's about posturing. It's about entertainment. I mean, the reason the name dropping, the reason the Whoopi Goldberg and the uh, Oprah Winfrey uh, is that the reason that there can be a project called African American Lives and African American Roots, which uh, uh, as a, in a documentary way looks into the family histories of some prominent uh, athletes and entertainers, the reason that this can happen is because uh, it's it's really about you know producing this uh, uh, this kind of glitzy this kind of uh, inside uh, the cultural elite this kind of uh, uh, entertainment product which is there's a demand for it out there no doubt about it but uh, yeah. what it's doing coming out of Harvard I really yeah. don't know yeah well it's uh, I guess the thing <clears throat> you know at the end of the day. Uh, when you get past the shameless name dropping, okay, well, that's too bad. 
uh, when you get past the fact that the piece is all over the place, as you say, I mean, it's got Margaret Thatcher on, you know, Margaret Thatcher version of 40 Acres and a Mule. It's got give out, you know, copies of Dr. Seuss. Uh, that's what uh, Jesse Jackson should be doing. And as you rightly say, Jesse Jackson has, uh, you know, been on the self-help. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is no brief for Jesse Jackson, but, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. He's been there, done that. Exactly. And, uh, and then... Um, uh, and then the quote from Galbraith is that the first step in reversing economic inequalities is greater voter participation, and I think he was right. So now we've got something for everybody. It's about voter participation. But didn't you just say that it was about self-help and about reading books? And about wealth accumulation. But, but didn't you say, just say before that it was about wealth? So there's a little here for everybody. So it's bad as social analysis. It's all over the place. Shameless name dropping. Uh, but the thing that I thought was, in a way, I don't know, worst about it. I mean, why compete? There are so many bad things. But here's another really bad thing about this. It starts off with this, what it's reported as the astonishing finding that 37% of African Americans feel that blacks can no longer be thought of as a single race. Now, first of all, I read that more than half full. 63% of African Americans think that blacks can still be thought of as a single race. I don't know if that's more or less than it was 30 years ago. I have no basis for comparison. But after reporting on these kind of identity-based divisions within the uh, black community, uh, uh, what, what, he, what um, Skip says is the message here is that it's time to examine the differences between black families on either side of the divide for clues about how to address an intri- increasingly entrenched inequality. Now, here's the headline sentence. We can't afford to wait any longer to address the causes of, of persistent poverty among most black families. And I think I agree that addressing the causes of persistent poverty among, uh, you know, black families, very important thing to do. But I didn't think it had to wait until you discovered that there was a kind of identity division within yeah. one, one thing no, had nor, nothing to do with the other. Nor are we going to get answers, I should think, to that problem by looking at, um, you know, the family histories of successful black families and exactly. less successful black families. I mean, the reason Galbraith said register these poor people to vote so that they could vote for public officials who would use the apparatus of government and the state in ways that would be more felicitous to the development of African-American lower-class communities. I mean, that's about real policies. It's about taxes. It's about the minimum wage. It's about immigration. It's about the earned income tax credit. It's about how you reform welfare. It's about what you do with urban development. It's about employment training. It's about health care. I could go on for a very long time. Josh. Oh, that's so old-fashioned, though, Glenn. Come on. Pardon? Policy matters to people's lives. Old-fashioned. Just kidding. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, 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 but I'm saying, you know, why yeah. vote? If, right. if, uh, the, if the answer is 40 acres in a mule or if the answer is uh, uh, hand out Dr. Zeus books to lower-class yeah. kids yeah. or if the answer is mimic right. uh, Margaret Thatcher's console housing policy about extending ownership to people living in public housing, which, by the way, was the favorite program of a certain Republican politician that no one remembers anymore named yeah. Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp. Yeah. Fifteen yeah. years ago. Yeah. You know, and the so thing is, <laughs> if you want to talk about giving out assets to people, you could say, why not say, uh, not 40 acres and a mule, but, you know, there's Bruce Ackerman and Ann Alstott, and they've got their idea of giving endowments of $80,000 to people, or you've got... Um, you know, base, you know, universal basic income slash uh, negative income tax uh, proposals. There are plenty of people other than um, Margaret. Anyway, yeah, I think and, we, and more, but let me just say one other thing about yeah, it. Yeah. Of course, the families which were most resourceful, most intelligent, yeah, yeah, most right. uh, uh, successful uh, are going to both spawn offspring who do well in life and manage to accumulate land in the tough conditions for African Americans of the late 19th and early 20th century. So there's no causal inference to be drawn from the fact that Oprah Winfrey's Winfrey's forebears may have owned land uh, in the South. Uh, Of course. Uh, You you know, I mean, it's as if he says, uh, if they had only given people land, then they would have been successful. But he can't possibly know that from the fact that those people who were successful also owned land. 
I mean, I hope that doesn't sound obscure to people who might be listening to this. No, because it's such no, a fundamental say, point. He, he does say that. He said, if there's a meaningful correlation between the success of accomplished African Americans today and their ancestors' property ownership, we can only imagine how different black-white relations w- would be had 40 acres and a mule really been official government policy in the Reconstruction South. That's exactly the inference you're complaining about. But, exactly. you know, this is we're, we're, we're doing uh, due diligence here yeah. because uh, it's easy to complain about people who are in another line of work uh, and, you know, complain that they're not doing it well. And we're going to get to that in a little while. But uh, here we've got somebody who's, uh, you know, we both know very, you know, at the, at the height of uh, a certain kind of um, academic success. Uh, yeah, but Josh, plenty of ex- be, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Josh. No. No, no. Just I, I just, was going to say. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was plenty of to... access and <laughs> and uh, and you know this thing is, uh, you know, I, I don't know what what's the right word for it. Crap, bullshit, uh, terror. It's just. Uh, but but it's wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the greatest university in the world. This yeah. is Harvard University. This yeah. is the pinnacle yeah. of of academic and intellectual. Okay. Now we're discussing black people, African yeah. Americans. This is not a small matter. It's important. Getting it right is important. Having the very best work done and then communicated is really important. What's up with an institution that puts the um, characterization of contemporary conditions of African Americans into the hands of people who don't know what they're doing? And what's up with a mechanism of public communication? I'm talking about the New York Times now. That takes this precious resource, which is its editorial page, and turns it over to somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about. So and your answer to that question is that this is the, that what you do is you hand it over to this, a certain kind of person who's positioned him or herself as being the official interpreter of black culture and black life Correct. for white Americans. Correct. And yeah. what I'm saying yeah. is, if we were talking about something really important here, mm-hmm. like science yeah. or war and peace, yeah. Uh, or something, it wouldn't be so. The mediocrity, I'm sorry, the yeah. amateurishness yeah. Uh, uh, wouldn't be tolerated. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. Gates has influence, and maybe I'm not going to get a grant somewhere that I want one day. Good, good. I hope he <laughs> hears it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Let's, let's, let's uh, <laughs> this is part of a, you know, there's a, there's a wider phenomenon here uh, of, um, of, uh, you know, the, I don't know, the public intellectual, and there are good and bad public intellectuals. There are a lot of not, there are a lot of public intellectuals who aren't in the academy. And, uh, you know, I think both of us think, you know, maybe it's just because of where we sit, but we both think that there's some important value to, uh, to being in the academy and to uh, publishing in the journals and to being subject to the kinds of intellectual discipline um, that comes from, uh, you know, being a member of an academic department and having to make your case to colleagues who know at least as much as you do, more than you, about most of the topics that you uh, write about. Right. And, um, uh, and so then we can have somebody like, uh, you know, we've talked about the case of, uh, you know, Skip, and, and, and you know, I, th- I think we're, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not, we have, we, the only thing that we disagree about is which part of it is worst, um, and I'm not sure how deep that disagreement goes, but yeah. what about, let, let's talk about this issue a little bit, uh, about what, what is the value of uh, that, that kind of academic discipline? Uh, we've talked before about uh, the case of uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, who's written some really monstrously bad stuff. Uh, he was, uh, uh, until recently, he was an external fellow of the Hoover Institution, and I've been looking on the Hoover website, and I'm not sure that uh, Dinesh is any longer an external fellow of Hoover. You He's, can't find him on the website. You can't find him on the website, wow. and I have, I'm, I'm checking into... Um, what the the situation here? Because I he wrote that book on nine yeah. eleven that started off 
not with the first sentence, but with the second sentence saying that, you know, the cultural left in the United States was responsible for 9-11, which it was just... Yeah, yeah. I've seen scurrilous reviews. I haven't, and I haven't read beyond the book. Yeah. stupid. I mean, really just dumbass. I, I know the argument. Uh, maybe it's become so embarrassing that the funders have pulled out or somebody in, in yeah. Hoover. I don't know. We'll find out soon enough. Uh, but, uh, yeah. But you, a, you were just... You, you, you I, I know, have some... You know some interest in this topic because of the the importance in some of the areas that you've worked in of uh, people who 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 come at the issues in a you know from you know who write about in you know issues from a with a non from a non in a non academic way and from a non academic background. I mean the, right. maybe the classic case of this was the. Uh, the bell curve. The uh, that's right. Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein. The bell yeah. curve. Uh, yeah. Actually, Charles Murray um, uh, is at the American Enterprise Institute as a senior fellow, and Dinesh yeah. D'Souza had been at the American yeah. Enterprise Institute before he moved out to the West Coast as a fellow. Yeah. And uh, they they produced some books in the mid 1990s. D'Souza's book called The End of Racism, mm -hmm. which I thought was awfully bad and insulting, uh, and e egregiously unacademic. And uh, and uh, Murray and Herrnstein's book, The Bell Curve, which a lot of everybody knows about and was quite on intelligence on IQ, not mainly about race, although they did have a chapter on racial differences in IQ. It was very controversial, playing up the right. the old um, um, uh, line about the uh, heritability, the genetically determined basis of IQ, and the mm -hmm. futility of social policy, which was constrained by the fact that people were unequal in their intelligence, mm -hmm. and so on. And I actually resigned uh, from the American Enterprise Institute's academic uh, advisory board. Uh, I was one of a number of distinguished, uh, more or less distinguished academics who served there because I thought these books were just profoundly inconsistent with standards of, um, of uh, standards of evidence, standards of proof, the quality, the vetting uh, by, uh, by peers in, who are specialists in the various fields. Uh, in some ways, D'Souza's book isn't even worth discussing in this context because it, like much of his writing, was just a kind of cartoon, a screed, a, a sort of, uh, you know, more or less well-written, uh, 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 you know, uh, kind of send-up of uh, the, of the uh, uh, academic left. <clears throat> Murray's book, I think, uh, Murray and Herrnstein, Herrnstein's Dead, yeah. uh, was, was much more mischievous because it went forward under this pretense that they were simply reporting what the scientific community yeah. in uh, neurology and, uh, and uh, cognitive psychology and in the social sciences, economics, and sociology, what the scientific community had already come to know but were mm -hmm. too polite to say out loud. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, one of the values of, of the academy is the discipline that comes with having to get past really smart people who know deeply the technical aspects of uh, how one might be handling data and evidence, how one's trying to draw conclusions of the nature of the arguments that one is making. And there's a kind of vetting that goes on in that. Uh, there's a back and forth that goes on in that. Uh, it gets read by some people, especially since this uh, rise of a kind of right-wing suspicion of the university. It gets read by some people, this vetting, as uh, being politically motivated. Yes. And it sometimes has been. Uh, politically motivated, but in the main, what it's about is the way we consensually, as a community of inquirers, of investigators, come to know something is by bandying it about among each other and having to persuade the great majority of our community who are experts and who are deeply trained that what we have to say has value. Uh, Murray did an end run around that process with the bell curve. Uh, there's a lot that's wrong in the bell curve that has been spelled out in detail by reviewers in uh, psychology and in uh, economics um, and uh, other fields in uh, the reviews that uh, came out after the book was published, yeah. but he's never really been held accountable for it. And uh, the, the, the sort of straw that broke the camel's back for me um, at the AEI was when I went to the president of uh, uh, um, Christopher DeMuth and I said, you know, look, Mary has put this book out there, 200,000 copies of it has been sold. Mm -hmm. If you pick up the reviews, you see uh, everywhere you look, deep and profound criticisms of it that he's never mm -hmm. answered. He wrote one reply to his critics, which was in Commentary Magazine, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. the neoconservative magazine edited yeah. by Norman Pothorz and Neil Kozadoy, yeah. yeah. and which said, of course the academics are upset. What can they do? I just burst their balloon. Right, right. You know, but isn't there maybe some truth in? I mean, let, let's let, <coughs> let's 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 yeah. let's focus down on this uh, a little bit. I mean, we we've talked about this before. It is true uh, that uh, there is the the um, spectrum of opinion uh, in the academy, the the political spectrum in the that uh, in the academy is uh, a pretty small subset of the political spectrum in the the country more generally. It's true, I think people have noted this, that uh, if you look at the distribution of intellectuals in universities, it's, you know, more sort of center, liberal, left. If you look at the distribution of intellectuals at think tanks, uh, they're more conservative, uh, Republican, maybe libertarian. Um, And so you describe, you know, a very attractive vetting process for ideas, and in some fields, I don't know, microbiology or in you know exper- some areas of uh, experimental physics or in chemistry, uh, that vetting process really works. Those are the areas of normal science where people know what the questions are, they know how you go about answering a question, and you publish something in a peer-reviewed journal, and uh, you know that that. Uh, uh, maybe counts for a great deal. When you look in other areas of the field, arguably um, they're governed by a kind of you know cultural and political consensus that makes things that may be true, certainly that may be worth saying, even if they're not true, that make them kind of hard to say. Um, it's harder to be, as you know from your own experience, it's harder to be a conservative in the. Uh, uh, in the academy, and uh, so, I, I, is it really that clear that the the vetting process that you're describing uh, works as well as you as well as you describe it? I mean, does it have a kind of false consensus building and imposing character to it, or is it really uh, you know a way of test, testing good and bad ideas and winnowing out the bad ones? Well. Uh, um you know that's that's a big subject. I, I yeah. do acknowledge and uh, accept that there's political correctness in the academy, and that if you pick up, I mean, I'm just going to name a journal, the American Journal of Sociology. I mean, yeah. no offense to the American Journal of Sociology, but you'll flip through it. You could flip through it, and you could probably find articles that are, um, you know, consistent with a certain par- uh, party line, whether it's about poverty or you know, right. uh, the culture or whatever, and you probably not find articles that sort of come at these uh, questions uh, in a way that's more friendly to the right, and that's all very true. And I think that has spawned um, a, um, a, a, a tendency in um, uh, some areas of research, especially that bear on policy, to develop, uh, you know, counter centers of expertise outside of the academy yeah. where people are less subject to these, uh, to these constraints. Uh, But my point about vetting, I mean, if you're at AEI and you want to write about tax policy or intelligence or poverty or whatever, in my view, you should also uh, uh, want to uh, get the benefit of the the sort of criticism of people who are uh, deeply practiced and expert in the field. And and I don't see that the two things are mutually incompatible. I guess that's what I'm trying to say at the end of the day, that the the technical value of the vetting and the... um, uh, independence of mind to be able to go against what might be a, a consensus, uh, a political point of view, uh, strike me as not being uh, inconsistent with each other. I mean, I can only talk about the field of economics, which I know very well. Yeah. And of course, there are biases and quirks and yeah. pe- you know peculiarities of the various journals. They have more to do with research style, I think, than they have to do with political content. Uh, but yeah, if you came out and said about, let's say, the problem of poverty that you were talking about in, in the global context, mm. and you came out and said, look, uh, all this aid stuff is bunk, it's not going to help anybody, mm. it's basically culture or genes, yeah. right? Africa is uh, impoverished because of culture and genes, not because of colonialism. A whole lot of people would be very upset about it, and you'd get a lot right. of flack, and you might get right. your paper rejected somewhere. Right. But at the end of the day, that argument is being made, isn't it? I mean, I think that argument is getting out there, and we want that, to the extent that that yeah. argument is being made, we want it to be, uh, you know, scientifically sound. 
Absolutely. I mean, there is a version of that argument, and I want to be very careful <clears throat> about this, uh, about about a piece of that argument, uh, which is the, the on the on aid. Yeah. They not doing any good. Uh, I happen to have the book here on my desk, the Bill Easterly book, The White Man's Bird. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've uh, seen it. And, you know, I, I, this is, I, I think this is a good example of a, a book that, uh, I, I think well of it. I mean, I, it's, I don't agree with all of it, mm-hmm. and I'll say make some critical comments in a second on it, but... Um, this, you know, Easterly is a very serious economist who makes the case that there have been, you know, $2.3 trillion that have gone into aid programs and that the, that money has been basically more or less wasted. Uh, and, uh, and he thinks that the, as the title, the white man's burden indicates, he thinks the money's been wasted because it's been guided along with policies of military intervention as well, which he's not, you know, tender about either, uh, all been guided by a kind of patronizing, paternalistic, racist, imperial, colonial sensibility. Yeah. Uh, And the thing that I think is important and interesting about the book is that Easterly knows the literature that makes the arguments on the other side about how aid has been helpful or about how aid has been helpful under certain kinds of circumstances. For example, if you have decent governance yeah. in place, then aid does contribute, whereas it's, you know, you're, you're excuse my language, pissing the money away yeah. if the governance is bad. And he... Uh, tells you which of the articles that have made this case he thinks are good. Um, there's uh, some stuff done by uh, Clements, Rattlet, and Bavnani, people who are at the Center for Global Development, and he argues, well, you know, tells you why he thinks those arguments are wrong. So he takes the arguments seriously, and also, uh, he at the end of the day, he isn't anti-aid. What he is is anti He's opposed to giving assistance that isn't tied to pretty specific programs and preferably specific programs that have been road tested, preferably road tested in some kind of controlled experiment way of the kind of MIT's poverty action lab style. So I think this is a good example of a book that's that's had a big impact, that's very carefully done, that's helped to improve the work that's been written. All of that said, I think somewhere in the course of writing the thing, and he, here you never know exactly where to blame the author and where to blame the uh, the uh, the the, uh, uh, the people at Penguin who uh, who uh, published the book. There are kind of exaggerated, uh, um, yeah, uh, state, you know, from from one of the world. This is the back cover from one of the world's best known development economists. An excoriating attack on the tragic hubris of the West's efforts to improve the lot. Of, uh, of the developing See, this world. Is, yeah, this is the kind of thing that gets uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, the economist at Columbia, right. uh, very, very upset. I mean, there's a scientific argument between Easterly and Sachs about just right. those propositions you were going over. Right. But there's also this rhetorical contest going on right. about what the narrative line is going to be. Is the line going to be, look, we tried to help these people. It, it uh, did more harm than it did good. And uh, the best we can do is just back off. Or, right. or is the line going to be, oh, my God, global poverty is the horror, is the ethical yep. challenge of our time. We yep. must redouble our efforts and commit ourselves. And, you know, it seems yep. to me that you can learn the wisdom of an easterly critique and take it seriously uh, and at the same time remain morally committed to uh, seeing this problem as a problem for all of humankind and a problem that, uh, that compels us to uh, commitment, to action, uh, and, and to sacrifice. I mean, I, right. those things are not necessarily inconsistent. They're not incompatible, and also they're not <clears throat> inconsistent with, and this is what I think, this is the point of mentioning the Easterly book, I, I, I think it's re- it's not inconsistent with taking a respect for evidence yeah. and argument and clarity of proposition seriously. Easterly lays it out there. Now, he also lays it on thick, He's a little bit, you know, gets a little, you know, meta- metaphorical in places. You don't sell as many books as he's been saying by things are by saying that things are complicated and things get a little oversimplified and, as I say, a little bit rhetorical. But hey, you know, uh, that happens to 
uh, it happens to everybody, uh, I think is an example of how you can take an important problem, take the evidence and arguments seriously, take clarity seriously, write something that's responsible to the evidence and responsible to the arguments that are being made. Uh, yeah. I think it's a pretty good example of it, although I wish the, I wish the packaging had been a little bit less... Um, uh, you know, brilliant and blistering indictment of the failure right. of Western aid to the poor, angry and irreverent. We need to face our own history of... Is it, we need to f- face our own history of ineptitude and hold our own aid agencies accountable for the results of their actions, especially, especially at a time when the plight of the world's poor is one of the most pressing issues we face. Now, I agree about that, but there's something else that Easterly says in this thing, which is he tells you what kind of assistance you ought to be giving. So and, it's not all just pissing on people. And, who've done and the he's wrong making thing. he's making his argument from within the yeah. discipline. I mean, uh, Bill Easterly is a well respected. I mean, he shows up at the conferences. You can't get Charles yeah. Murray to show up in anything. He right. uh, yeah. he answers his colleagues. I mean, he his uh, the body of work of which this book is representative is built on scholarly uh, research, getting grants from the main uh, uh, scientific uh, supporters of this kind of research, and publishing in the mainstream journals. He comes around to conferences and to uh, academic departments and presents to small groups and deals with the criticisms that come up and so forth and so on. Yeah. So one thing that I want to mention, before <clears throat> we should probably move on, yeah. but one thing I want to mention on uh, you, when you were, you know, characterizing the terms of the debate and you mentioned, you know, what, what's, you know, it is very much true, which is that the, the kind of global poverty and destitution debate is increasingly an argument, as in the Paul Collier book, The Bottom Billion, increasingly an argument about um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Uh, because if you look, you know, if you look at the places where most poor people in the world are, it's not sub-Saharan Africa. The places where most poor people under two dollar a day, under one dollar a day poverty, China. it's tr- China and India, because yeah. that's where most of the people well, are. And yeah, those are exactly. pretty poor countries. But when you got a place that's growing to ten to twelve percent a year doubling GDP per capita, if you're going, you know, going 10% a year, you double it every seven years, uh, and, you've ne- and they've also never taken a They're not going to be poor for long if they can They're not going to be poor problems. for long. Right, in an, in an ex- right, exactly. In an expected value sense, uh, they're not, <laughs> the, the problem of poverty maybe is being uh, addressed there, although the earth may be suffering a lot from it, and the water supplies around Beijing may be suffering. We've got big problems, but, Josh. We'll very have, big we'll problems. We need to talk the, about. <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing, the, one of the most interesting upbeat things that I heard was in one of the last presentations, and this was by... Uh, uh, Ted Miguel, who's a development economist at Berkeley, and he gave a presentation um, on what's been happening for the last five to seven years in sub-Saharan Africa. And th- actually, the story is 3% plus growth rates continent-wide over a period of five to seven years, first time in more than 30 years that there really has been sustained positive uh, economic performance. Now, there's a big question, very open question, and of practical importance as well as intellectual importance about what the sources of that are. Is it commodity prices? Is it yeah. Chinese infrastructural investment? Um, is it governance reforms? A lot, a lot more democracy and rule of law in Africa than there was 20 years ago. Yeah. Some, you know, some evidence that it's uh, uh, governance reforms. But there, but the the thing that he was emphasizing, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's we, we should accept good news while we're you know, listing all the bad news. Uh, it was, uh, um, what looks like is happening is, as I say, for the first time since, you know, the mid-1970s or something like that, uh, what you have is, you know, a, re- a real, not just one-year uptick and not just in one country, but a sustained uh, turnaround in economic performance could be dragged down. Still, a lot of big civil wars and some, you know, pretty nasty neighborhoods yeah. uh, there. Uh, climate keeps getting bad, and those places are going to be hit really, Very, really badly, yeah, be really there. tough. Uh, but um, you know, just mixing in a, a bit of good news into the story, uh, looks like there's some. Good news there. Three uh, percent con- continent-wide growth over the last five to seven years. That's that's something I didn't know. It's it's pre- yeah and uh, yeah yeah no it's really uh, okay. It's, it's, so what's it's, next it's, on our agenda? Next on our agenda. So now that we've talked about the shamelessness in the in uh, uh, Gates and at great and career-inhibiting length. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Career inhibiting length. Come on, man. Exactly. This, guy, this guy is known in certain quarters. Yeah. I'm talking about yeah. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Yeah. as the Booker T. Washington of our time, which is to say, right. you know, if you really want the Ford Foundation or somebody yeah. to do something for you, you know, he's the guy that they're going to run it past if it has to do with race, and he, he's likely to say no if, you, if he's not happy with you. This is what I've yeah. heard. I don't know if it's true yeah. or not. Uh, uh, listen, whatever. I've sat through many conversations over many years with uh, Gene Rivers, and, and there isn't anything that you've said that Gene didn't say in in much more colorful I, terms, I don't know about that. As, you can, as you can well imagine. Yeah. How about let's 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 try something. We talked about it a little bit before, but something I don't know really uh, different. Let's talk about religion. Um, so oh, right. th- there's there's uh, uh, Glenn Lowry uh, went through a period of being uh, 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 born again. Uh, described yourself in a previous conversation as not being as uh, good a Christian as, good a Christian as, as I used to be, as you used to be, or maybe as you should be. Well, but at least you said as you used to be. Here I am. I'm a you know what a secular. Um, uh, never, ne- never had any religious upbringing. I, as I think I've said before in conversations with you, Glenn, I don't have the kind of Dan Dennett, uh, uh, kind of content. militant anti, yeah. you know, religiosity. And so I, I, I only hesitate in describing myself as an atheist because it conveys that militant religiosity. Whereas I, I just, I have a very deep intellectual interest in. Um, uh, religion and have written some about it in work in political philosophy about the role of religious religious claims in political discourse and about religious exemptions from law and and have also read a lot of uh, uh, theology just along with the Bible and the Quran uh, and spent a lot of time reading about Confucianism so I have an intellectual interest that I think it's in a, but 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 I'm not a kind of it's I'm not an insider. To it, uh, and I thought maybe we could. We well, could, I'm not, I, let, I, let me start talking then. I mean, I, yeah, I will ahead. just say yes. Um, I went through a period in my life, a lot of uh, personal adversity and uh, turmoil in my life. My marriage almost breaking up, a uh, problem with drugs and alcohol, uh, public embarrassment about various things, yeah. and I found some comfort and uh, and essential support uh, in. Um, in a, a newly acquired Christian faith as I was coming through those years and coming out of it. Uh, and for a while, I think, I'm thinking back now, late 80s, early 90s, um, my two sons with uh, my second wife, Linda, um, were born um, in 1989 and 1991, respectively. And um, it, it just seemed like a mere miraculous transformation of my life was ongoing. And the, the church... Uh, relatively theologically conservative African-American uh, Protestant church uh, was was really central to our lives as a family and to my life personally uh, in those years. Um, but I don't know. Various things happened to me, and I won't go into great detail. I'm, I'm happy to talk about them, but I don't want to take too much of our time just talking about myself to say that, oh, I don't know, around 95, 96, 97, uh, I, I sort of, the intellectual in me, the kind of, you know, uh, can I really try to understand something in, in terms of intellect and not just in terms of my feeling or my emotion or my sort of desperate need for order in my life or mm-hmm. the kind of uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, transcendent uh, sense of uh, calm and such that one, in, in actual religious experience, I mean in the experience of worship, of prayer, uh, you know, almost the kind of ecstatic aspects of it, the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, people have been talking about for a long time. William James, I think of, and others, many. Um, uh, it sort of came into conflict with my more rationalistic, more analytical, more trying to, you know, can I give a real account? I mean, the bottom line on this for me is that I just couldn't make myself believe in magic. You know, I couldn't mm-hmm. make myself mm-hmm. believe in stuff that I could not give reasons for, that I yeah. could not provide arguments for. And I didn't want to be asked to believe in things that I couldn't right. give reasons for. Uh, so I, I felt myself cooling off to this and unable to go through the motions quite with the same enthusiasm and feeling fraudulent. Uh, I stepped down from Prison Fellowship Ministries, which was a conservative, you know, Charles Colson-led, yeah, but very yeah. good, I think, uh, effort to help uh, people in prison throughout the world. 
I stepped down mainly because I couldn't keep going to those meetings and praying with those uh, men mm -hmm. and women and kind of, you know, going through this uh, enactment when I didn't really deeply feel the conviction. It felt so fraudulent to me. And even though mm -hmm. I, I liked the work and I got along quite well with people, political yeah. differences notwithstanding, uh, I felt that I had to step out of that uh, out of that milieu. And I've stepped back far back from involvement in uh, my local church, yeah. uh, perhaps to my former pastor's chagrin. He's a good man, um, mm -hmm. Ray Hammond of the Bethel AME Church. I know. He's a very good, he's very a very good really man. wonderful person. I yeah. have tremendous admiration for him and his wife and his children and the yeah. fellowship that worships with them. But, um, no, it, it just hasn't been the path for me. Uh, so I'm out here. I'm, I'm very interested in religion. I, I read a lot about... Yeah. Uh, both the politics, the political philosophy, and such, and also yeah. about the. I'm, I'm just, curious, Glenn, yeah. if, if if I had a I, I asked you, let's say in 1990 or 1992, um, you know what? Tell me, don't tell me why you believe in God or in the have accepted. Jesus Christ as your savior yeah. or why you believe that Jesus Christ is your savior if I didn't if I didn't say why do you believe that but just tell me what it is that you believe what is okay what sure. would you what would you have said you know if you would just again not justify it but just elaborate for me if I had said to you elaborate for me just what the content of your beliefs yeah. is what do you think you would have said? Well, I think I would have said something like, there's a God in heaven yeah. uh, who made the world mm -hmm. and who fashioned a way for us transient beings to be in relationship with his uh, transcendent self. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and you know, so mm -hmm. the stuff goes. But it would have been simply that. It would have been that the maker of the world is interested in me. And, of course, if you'd asked me in 1991, Josh, yeah. I would have had to say he's also interested in you. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? In yeah. other words, yeah. in other words yeah. I can't believe yeah. this and know this to be true yeah. and not share it with you, Josh, because I don't want your soul to wander forever or whatever, you know. Right. But, right. but I would have yeah. said the point, the main point here is that uh, there is a God who made the world, and he's interested in each and every one of us, and there is a way to be in relationship with him, and here's mm -hmm. the way. And so, he, so let me um, explain, you know, why I asked the question, yeah. um, and, and and then we can come back to the things that you said about there's a God in heaven that God made. The, there's a God that God is in heaven, that God made the world, and that that God fashioned a way for uh, is that God, God is concerned with each individual. And fashioned a way for each individual to be in connection with him. Yeah, so, and, and through, I might so, just add, and having established that connection, uh, there's power, as our president has said, wonder working power. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's transformative power yeah, in yeah. that relationship. Right. You will be made new, you will be uh, empowered to achieve right. things that you never thought were. You can conquer the right. obstacles that have been heretofore holding you yeah. back, and so forth. So here's here's what I so there's a tradition uh, a tradition of thinking that the core of religious conviction is ethical. It's not metaphysical. It's not a, a, a kind of quasi scientific belief about how the world was created. I mean, maybe that's true as well, but that that's part of it. But the core is a set of ethical convictions, and you get this in, uh, among others, in uh, Spinoza, and you get it in Kant as a statement about what the the nature of uh, religion yeah. is. That the, the the essence of it is an ethical uh, conviction, and then that ethical set of ethical convictions about the importance of individuals and their the, the importance of their lives and the importance of some kind of community yeah. between and among individuals so that that set of convictions is then given a kind of um, you know surrounded with a, a, a kind of a story about creation and um, okay. yeah okay. communication etc but the real and and for a long time I I thought 
okay, if that's, uh, you know, I think that, that makes a certain amount of sense to me, and I, I can understand I have my ways of expressing my ethical convictions, and if somebody wants to say, um, if somebody wants to say, I uh, the, express a conviction about, say, human equality, by saying not simply that human beings are of equal importance, but by saying they were all human beings were created by a God who loves them. I could think of that as just a different, you know, vocabulary, so to speak, for expressing the same kind of uh, moral conviction. But then I came across a, a, a study that was reported about 10 years ago in um, Time magazine, and it was a study on... Um, religious beliefs of Americans. And it's, I don't remember the details exactly, but at first approximation, the story went something like this. So the story, it would say, they would ask people, so do you believe that there is a God? Uh, and, you know, 90% of the respondents would say, yes, they did. And then they would say, uh, well, does he have a beard? And 35% would say, yes, he has a beard. Uh, and then they would say, well, do you believe in hell? And, you know, 80% of people would say they believed in hell. And then they say, is it really hot there? And 35% would say, yes, it's really hot there. So there were a large number of people who would express religious beliefs. And I, and I think, well, you know, they have their way of expressing their ethical convictions. I've got my way. Mine isn't religious. Theirs is. But I feel like I understand the, what what's being said. But then there were those you know, 35% of people who would insist on, who would insist that it was, you know, uh, on giving a kind of literalism to the religious beliefs, and those were the ones that I didn't understand. I felt like well, I don't here, here, understand me, what they believe. Let me let me see if I can help out here a little bit because I I don't accept this problem. I mean, it, it well may be as a, a kind of anthropological account of religion yeah. as a cultural practice. Yeah. that you could give an account of it that emerges out of, well, there's a core kind of moral sense or yeah. set of ethical yeah. convictions, and yeah. then one needs a narrative in order to make those things uh, sort of, you know, packageable and transmittable and communicable and so forth. Right. But I think that's putting... That was Spinoza's view. It was ethics plus local color for the purposes of transmission. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I get that. I see that. Yeah. I, can, I can imagine uh, a guy like Spinoza putting it yeah. just like that. But yeah. in the church where we <laughs> worship, yeah, yeah. that's putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. You know what I mean? In other words, what good does it do you to know all of these rules if you don't feel the power within you mm -hmm. of a living God who moves you to obey those rules and to embody yeah. those rules in your life? Right. And so, and, and, and this is why I became a bad Christian, because I yeah. could not by the uh, the metaphysical claims. But the yeah, metaphysical... Right. But, and I also couldn't continue in the religious practice uh, denying the metaphysical claims. Mm -hmm. In other words, if right. this is all a ruse, if this, these are all just pretty words and a song and yes. dance that we go through in order to get us around to seeing certain basic truths which are uh, really independent of, of any yeah. uh, particular religious claim, yeah. Yeah. then, uh, then uh, you know, I don't need that. You right. know? Right. But, but, but the actual position is uh, quite the contrary of that. Yeah. And, and the reason why perhaps so many people are so literalist, and I'm not a literalist and I never was, yeah. Uh, is there, there uh, maybe intuitive grasping of this idea, which is that, you know, it's all about the blood. That's the way the Christians would say it. It's all about something that actually happened in history. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. There yeah. was a man who was the right. Son of God, who walked on earth, who died, and who rose and sits at the right-hand side, mm -hmm. and through who, belief in whom, uh, you too can come into this relationship. And if those claims are false, which I have yeah. come to think they probably are, I mean, how could they yeah. be true? I'm thinking, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I, and my Christian yeah. friends out there, I, I hate to offend you, but, you know, this is what yeah. we're talking about here. Yeah. If those claims are false, then they're false. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. They're so, not metaphorically so, true. So I might as well go to Kant. Do you know? Yeah. I mean, the yeah. Sermon on the Mount is poetry. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's powerful, lyrical poetry. And I believe it expresses ethical truths. Mm -hmm. But I think the deduction of them as true with a capital yeah. T is more likely to be found in Kant than it is to be found in uh, the New Testament. You know, when you said it's all about the blood, I had a, a, a very <laughs> bright flash of seeing the uh, 
the, the movie uh, The Passion, yeah. uh, which I saw three or four times, wow. and that was all about the blood. I mean, it was a very powerful uh, expression of, uh, of uh, the idea that it was all about the blood. So, so, But then to put yourself back in 1990 when you were a believer... And if I had, I, I would, I've never said anything like this to anybody who is. I don't have any desire to convert anybody from the, from belief to non-belief. I, uh, and I just think these are, you know, topics uh, that you know are, I, I, you know, are best, uh, you know, left alone. People should, you know, the, these convictions are important to people, and it's very easy to insult and offend. Sure. By, uh, re- but if I had said to you in 1990. So, Glenn, you think that there is a God and the God is in heaven. I don't, it's not that I, I, I might have said something to you like, it's not that I exactly disagree with that. Of course, I don't, it's not that I agree with it either. I'm just not sure what you're, what, what, I'm not sure what you're saying. Yeah. There's yeah. a God who's in heaven. What are you yeah, well, I, I mean, what, what, technically, what is it I, I don't require the heaven part, but but I take, okay. I, I see where you're going, and I, I I agree with you. It's an unintelligible claim. It yeah. could be an unintelligible claim, and you know what it reminds me of, Josh. I'm not going to answer you directly. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of this great play, A Raisin in the Sun, uh, by yeah. Lorraine Hansberry, and there's a scene in there where this is an African American family in Chicago yeah. in the 1950s. Right. Yeah. It's about race in America, and obviously we can't tell the whole plot of the play, but there's a scene yeah. in there with this family that's hard pressed. Uh, there's a daughter who's going to college or wants to go to college or whatever, and she's an intellectual, and she's questioning a lot of stuff. And there's her mother who came up from the South during the Great Migration to Chicago to try to raise a family and whose husband has died, worked himself to death trying to take care of his family, and who still has hopes and dreams for her children and grandchildren and who is a devout uh, Christian believer. Mm-hmm. And there's a scene where the daughter basically questions her mother's faith. Mm-hmm. And the mother goes up and slaps her face and says, repeat after me, in my mother's house there is still God. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she makes her daughter, Benitha, repeat that phrase, and her daughter mm-hmm. repeats it. And then when the mother leaves the room, she mutters the daughter under her breath, well, all the tyranny in the world won't put a God in heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and I've, I've read that play with my, uh, with my older son, uh, mm-hmm. with my whole family, but my older son, who was a declared agnostic and uh, we joust about religious stuff all the time because even though I'm not as good a Christian as I used to be, I'm I'm still sympathetic to the enterprise and he has no sympathy for it. He's 18. He thinks for himself. And and we we go through that and and I try to get him to see what the daughter's offense was there. And I try to get him to see that the nature of the debate between the daughter and the mother in that scene in A Raisin in the Sun is not about uh, a fact claim. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's about how I got from Mississippi to Chicago, how I endured racism, Mm -hmm. how I raised Mm -hmm. a family, how I got by on uh, federal uh, uh, gifts of cheese and flour when we didn't have anything to eat, and how I keep going from day to day, how I get up in the morning and move. I can't live without that faith, is what the mother is telling her daughter, and you must respect it. You have to, don't be so glib. Don't think right. you know everything. Right. Live right. a little bit of life. Walk a mile or two in my shoes. Suspend yeah. disbelief long enough to see what I'm talking about here. Yeah. This is a well, way of life. Yeah. This is a way yeah. of life, is what the yeah. mother is saying to her yeah. daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Not a claim about whether yeah. or not a certain yeah. event occurred. Right. Well, that's why I'm, uh, that's why, yeah. Well, that's why I was wanting to have this conversation, because I, I'm, because now I'm a little, I'm a little, we, 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 I'm a little confused because you just gave an interpretation of what the mother is saying, where you said it's not about an event that occurred or whether it occurred right. or not. It's about life, and it's about a way of life. And I can't give you an intellectual account of the convictions that I have, um, uh, but this is. You know what? You know what? Th- this is a you know a way of life, and it's gotten me through. You know, it's what's gotten me through life. It's what moved me from Mississippi to Chicago. It's what made a way out of no way. Exactly. You know, it's That's what it. you know turned dark yesterdays into bright tomorrow. I'm telling you, this stuff is you powerful, know. man. This, yeah. You know, it's what you know. It's why the arc of the moral universe is long, but it's turned toward justice. Exactly. I mean, you know, right. you know, it's about why truth cr- crushed to earth will rise. Uh, but 
God's not finished with us yet, and all of that. God is stuff, not right. finished with us yet. That's right. And 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 then, I, 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 that, but what, what you're what you're saying when you when you describe the importance of convictions of this kind, and uh, convictions may be the wrong word. I mean, convictions and um, attitudes and and, a, and practices, a way of life. It's about the importance of them that, that I would never have this conversation with somebody who was not at sufficient you know d- distance from the convictions to be kind of reporting on you know so you know a kind of a past self because i think they cut so much to the core it's, it's interesting uh, how you, you say this i i agree and you say you're confused and it makes me think that i may be i may be a little bit incoherent here myself i mean on the one hand yeah. i say i can't believe on yeah. the other hand i give this case about why it is that people believe but and what it is that they believe, what, you know, what the nature of religious conviction is. And on the one hand, you're saying you can't have it if you don't think that there's a God who's done certain things and that is, you know, uh, uh, you know, gave his only begotten son, uh, sacrificed in order to take the sins of his, you know, of humankind uh, to cleanse humankind of uh, sins and that there was an event in the world. It's about the blood. It was about... And on the one hand, that, that it's there has to be some historical, you know, veracity there in order to believe. But on the other hand, there's a there's a, a reading that you're giving about the nature of religious conviction that sort of points in a different yeah. direction. And that it is something more about about you know life, and it's something that's more practical, and it isn't really about a set of, you know, of beliefs that you can list and subject to independent criticism. And, well, I mean, this just, is a topic just to a, a small amendment, which is that, yeah, it should be continuing. I realize we can continue. The small amendment yeah. would be what I was saying was that was the offense of the daughter yes. who right. questioned her mother's belief. Yeah. So she ought to have forbear, forborn, if that's a word. She ought not to have questioned. Yes. And the reason she ought not to have yes. questioned is she ought to have recognized exactly what it was that she was questioning mm-hmm. when she raised the question. Whether or not her yeah. question has value as a, you know, as a kind of epistemological right. matter is another question yeah. altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I get, I mean, I'll give this metaphor. You know, sometimes you're laying on the beach and you look up at the clouds and you can see Abraham Lincoln's face there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, darn it, those clouds look just like old Abe Lincoln's uh, profile mm-hmm. or whatever it is on Mount Rushmore. Then yeah. you turn your head away and you look back again, and f- for the life of you, you can't see it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, you know, what it was like for me. I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, I had doubt, and doubt, of course, is a part of faith, and, you know, yeah. th- these are deep uh, questions yeah. here. But, I mean, yeah. there isn't anybody, you know, Mother Teresa, the doubt and all of that that came out in that report not long ago, uh, yes. some of her correspondence that was released or whatever, um, of course there's doubt. But even when I was a believer, when I was more of a believer or whatever, uh, I, I could keep the doubt at bay. Uh, and then just one day I looked up and I couldn't find Abraham Lincoln's face anymore. Yeah. The doubt had just overwhelmed me. Right. So, one last question on this. <laughs> well, we can, I think this is a conversation that we should continue. I think it's a hard conversation to have, but I think it's worth having and uh, I'd, I'd like to keep it going. I, one, one last question on this, which is um, if I told you that uh, over the next 10 years uh, I don't know, murder rates in the country are going to go down, you think great, great news if I told you that inequality had gone down and the inequality had gone down not because all the wealthy people lost their money but because yeah. people who are less well off were doing a lot better I, you know, I think you'd think great, yeah. that's uh, good, more good news right. uh, if I said that uh, you know, car, car carbon in the atmosphere was <laughs> diminishing, you'd say good news. If I told you, if I said I can tell you with some confidence that over the next 10 years in the country, um, the level, uh, the the breadth, the level, the depth, the range of religious conviction is going to increase, Would you? what would your... Uh, you think, I got oh, the feeling it's a trick question. I mean, no, no. Okay, I'm just well, kidding. well, you know, my worry would be, of course, what kind of religious belief, yeah. you know. And I'm glad to see that uh, people like Pat Robertson and James Dobson yeah. and others don't seem to be able to determine who's going to be on the Supreme Court in the future. Although they have yeah. had great influence yeah. on who was elevated to the Supreme Court in the past. Uh, I'm glad to see that the uh, set of attitudes about uh, people who uh, happen to be homosexual 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the nature of their citizenship and the quality of their personhood seem to be moving in the direction of equality for those people in this country. Uh, if you looked over the last, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 years or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that that's a, a trend that's going in, quote, the right direction. So if, if the result of this increase in religiosity were to be that those uh, developments, uh, the kind of discrediting of the ultra, um, uh, of the ultra, uh, you know, um, orth I, I want to say yeah. ultra-orthodox, except it has another meaning within Judaism, but yeah, you know what I right. mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, conservative Protestantism, yeah. the discrediting of that, the sort of yeah. defanging of that, uh, and the, uh, I, I mentioned homosexuals, but I could give many other examples of, you know, uh, policies. If, if you told me that uh, the result of this religiosity was going to be that abortion was going to be outlawed and state yeah. after state and Roe yeah. was going to be overturned, uh, I'd be alarmed at the increase in religiosity. On the other hand, yeah. if you told me that it was going to be an increase in re religiosity but of a kind that was consistent with uh, certain public values of the sort that uh, you, know, you would be able to articulate better than me being a political philosopher of a tolerance, of a pluralism, uh, of a kind of you know, not the, the comprehensive, the embrace of comprehensive doctrines would grow, but the accommodation of a of a middle ground of of, of civic uh, and civil uh, discourse and, and political cooperation would would be sustained. Uh, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, it wasn't really a trick question. I was just distinguishing <laughs> between. I was, I mean, that's a, you know, it seemed. I don't know. I guess it's the only answer that that anybody could give to the question. But it did seem to me that there was a. Um, you know that I don't know. This is a kind of. There's some truth in the idea that you know. Re, you know, religion is no better than the people who have it, as opposed to <laughs> thinking that you know religiosity makes people uh, uh, makes people uh, better. And I don't say that in you know disparaging of. Uh, well, you could uh, go. I mean, religion. I realize what I did in the conversation, but I mean, you could you know, um, if we were of a certain religious sensibility, what would yeah. be our attitudes toward poverty? If we were of a certain mm -hmm. religious conviction, what would be our attitudes toward stewardship of the planet? Yeah. How would we look uh, at uh, two and a uh, quarter million people being locked up in jails in this country? Uh, what would we say about uh, the militarism mm -hmm. uh, that seems so to animate our collective response to the yeah. tragic events of 9-11-01? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean... Uh, it strikes me that Martin Luther King's religiosity um, uh, did wonders for the quality of America's uh, public life uh, as they were applied, as his religious beliefs uh, came to be embodied in a political practice and came to influence the course of events in the country. Yeah. And I can imagine that across a broad set of uh, fronts. I mean, if this, if this uh, uh, born-again uh, fundamentalist Protestant uh, um, component of our society, which is large, were really to mobilize behind the gospel as understood by uh, Josh Cohen and Glenn Lowry. That is, the gospel is understood by Glenn Lowry, yeah, yeah. and the implications of the gospel as embraced by Josh Cohen. Yeah. Uh, this would be a marvelous thing, I, I should think. Yeah. Right, uh, I, I guess, yeah. No, I, I, as I say, I don't have any, this doesn't come from an anti-religious uh, uh, animus, but just that uh, it was. I mean, you make the point when you say uh, the answer to the question is, you know, like with if there if inequality is reduced, you don't say, well, gee, it depends whether I. What, my response to that kind of depends. But with religiosity, the answer to the question, would you be happy or unhappy to hear that really religiosity had increased, is, you know, it depends. It depends on yeah. you know what the what the convictions are and who's holding them and what kind of role they play in people's lives and how it animates their conduct. One quick last question, yeah. and then we should stop, Glenn. Uh, I just want to say this, Josh. I'd sum it up by modifying Christopher Hitchens title. Yeah. He says, God is not great. I would say, God can be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> in the hands of the right people. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> quick comment on the presidential uh, campaign. Oh, uh, well, it's heating up, huh? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I saw Andrew Sullivan's piece in The Atlantic about yeah. uh, why Obama matters, and I thought it was really kind of interesting. And he says, Obama transcends the generational conflict that comes out of the 60s, born mm -hmm. of Vietnam and of the sort of cultural crisis of, uh, the, of, of feminism and uh, civil rights and all of that. And Obama is the best unstated advertisement you could give to a Muslim kid sitting in Damascus or Jakarta or Karachi 
about why the United States is really a much more complicated and benign place than he may have been told in the madrasa right. uh, and all of that. And I thought that that was interesting. But I'm still for Hillary, mm-hmm. notwithstanding all the drawbacks, because I think she's savvy enough and she and Bill and tough enough to uh, overcome the uh, what I'm sure are going to be the fitful and desperate last throws uh, death knell of of this right wing conspiracy that's had our country in its throes for the last quarter of a century. I want to go with the grown ups this time around. Yeah, yeah, well, I, 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 yeah. I can un- I, I can understand that. I uh, uh, but you say I you're just, not all that happy with Hillary. I'm not that happy with Hillary for a couple of different reasons, uh, and uh, I, I can't stand uh, the stuff that she's been saying about Iran. Uh, yeah. I don't like her voting record on Iran. I do think that this is, you know, an issue of, um, you know, just gigantic importance. I mean, I don't love, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an Ahmadinejad lover. Uh, we have <laughs> well, like two, no. two, issue, two articles in the next issue of Boston Review that just has come out, and the articles are now online. One is by Abbas uh, Mileni, who teaches here at Stanford, and the other is by Akbar Ganji, and uh, Abbas's article is about Ahmadinejad and um, where he comes from and how oh. to think about him, and, and the, the Ganji article is about what he describes as gender apartheid in Iran. Wow. So these are both very critical pieces about yeah. Iran, but they are also, these are two guys who are, have been kind of central figures, particularly Ganji, in the campaign against any kind of U.S military pressure on or attack on uh, Iran. In fact, it comes back to the the uh, the, the, the presidential issue because I think th- their views are very well represented in the in in the Obama campaign. Uh, and I think it's no accident. I think that there are, you know, people are talking to people and I think there's about one degree of separation between Obama and uh, these guys. I see. And I don't know who Hillary is uh, talking to, but the kind of... Um, it, you know, she. The, the problem generically is the is that she seems to feel a need. I understand why. Yep. Sort of. I feel a need to prove that she's tough, and it's partly a gender issue, and it it's is. partly a Democrat issue, and it's partly a you know where she's been in the past, and uh, but uh, th- that need to prove herself tough could be, you know, really, really uh, costly. And I think, uh, uh, you know, Obama may be an adult to a fault, uh, and that I know is your concern, but I don't have the sense uh, of him as somebody who's feeling the need uh, to prove that. He's certainly not going around trying to make that case, either very much in the campaign or on the foreign policy side, and the Iran issue really crystallizes it for me. So I, I'm Okay, I, 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 I hear you, and I think there's a great deal of value in what you're saying. I'm really glad that Boston Review is out there and is writing pieces mm-hmm. like this. I'm certainly going to take a look at what you guys been talking about. But the last thing I want to say to you is that, you know, you could end up with Rudy Giuliani. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm you gotta, afraid that we're going to end up with Rudy Giuliani if uh, Hillary runs okay, against Okay, so then I mean, that becomes running. an important question of whether or not you, you think your your chances of ending up with Rudy Giuliani are, are reduced or increased if uh, Obama is the nominee becomes an important question. Because I'm just, all I'm saying is the choices are not between an Obama who might be influenced by some people who you think have their heads yeah. on straight about Iran yeah. and yeah. a Hillary Clinton who might be posturing to try to show that she can be as tough as the next person. Those might not be the choices. Right, I, I, that's, uh, I, I, I agree with you. And uh, if I were sure that Hillary Clinton could beat Giuliani, uh, then I would, that would uh, move me some. The, the numbers are not looking, uh, not looking too good on that. I also just la- one last point for me is that I think uh, you know I've said this before, not in conversations with you, but on on blogging heads and conversations with Brink Lindsay, just uh, that. Uh, you know, day one, January 21st, Hillary Clinton gets elected and, you know, somewhere between 42 and 48 percent of the population hate her already. And living through four years of that or eight years of that, given where we've been for the past 20 years, is a pretty uh, a pretty dismal prospect. I don't think the negatives on, on Obama or, for that matter, on Edwards are uh, quite so high. And I, I think it would be a, it would end up being a pretty grim period. Now, it's true that, you know, you might say – that's like giving veto power over Hillary Clinton's election to her enemies. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, look, um, I 
think and, 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 the and question is about who the question is who's going to be president. Nobody's got the right to be president. And no, if but, but, the sheer fact of, you know, kind of nasty, you know, de- degraded politics and turmoil uh, keeps, you know, Hillary Clinton. But they're wrong to hate her. I mean, you know, yes. so, suppose yeah. that were being said about a black candidate. I mean, it's true yeah. that Obama is not that kind of candidate, but you could imagine right. viable candidates about right. who that would be said. Right. And, and not only is it wrong to give these people veto power, but yeah. I think we oughtn't to uh, preclude that people can be won over by the way somebody governs. And, yeah. and you know, a lot of people hated uh, Bush after Bush v. Gore, but a lot more people hated Bush after he got through running the country into the ground. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. I'll give I, you the last word on that. To be continued, run. of course. Okay, good to talk. As okay. always, Josh. Okay, Bye. bye-bye.